Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning, I'll be reading from the book of Matthew, and I'll be reading chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, and this is what it says. Jesus is doing the talking here, and he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peck measure, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Pray with me. Jesus, this day... Shine, shine in, shine through, and use us to do exactly that. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. My daughter loves to bake, loves to cook, and always has. I can remember as a little girl, one Saturday morning, she said, Hey, Dad, can we make pancakes? Well, that was kind of our thing, is cooking and baking. Usually what I did is I would just kind of point to things and she'd put them together and bake it. And she was still as much better at that than I am. Well, this particular morning, I was just going to grab the, the box of pancake mix, but I went to the pantry and we didn't have any. So I took a quick glance at my mother's recipe and I said, Hey, Em, you want to make pancakes the way Nana and I used to make pancakes? And so I got a little flour and let her sift it. You know, the more mess you make, the better it is, the more fun it is for her. She was about six years old, I guess, seven years old. And, and so we got a little baking powder and um, she measured it out. She put it in there. I said, now you mix all your dry ingredients together. And then I said, and we get a little milk and we get an egg and put it in there. She got to where she could crack an egg and, and dump it in there. I said, now the real key is that it's the right consistency. So we both mixed the bowl until the, the batter was the right consistency. We had a large flat skittle and she would make the, the sm small pancakes and I would make the larger ones. And we put butter on there to make those pancakes beautiful. And we had our powdered sugar on the side. That's what my mother used to do. So once you made this beautiful pancake you could put as much powder sugar or as little powder sugar as you wanted just to give them a little beauty and to make them taste a little better and we made those pancakes and they were gorgeous her two little pancakes were fantastic my two larger pancakes they were beautiful we put a little powdered sugar on them and they were gorgeous they were beautiful we 
put syrup on them. They were even more gorgeous. They were even more beautiful. Then we had a blessing over them. We had beautiful and blessed pancakes. And now it was time to, to put the fork in them and to taste them. We put them in our mouths. And I said, Emily, they're missing something. And with this wry little grin, she said, yes, the flavor. <laughs> what they were missing was the salt. Now, the salt is in there just to give it flavor. If it tastes salty, you put way too much. And that's the purpose of salt. This morning we read, Jesus said, you are the salt of the world. That... Uh, it's that salt, sometimes people talk about salt was a preservative that people used for meat. And that's true, but that's not the way Jesus talks about. He says, you're the salt of the earth. But if it's become tasteless, he talks about the purpose of the taste of the salt, not that it's a preservative. Other times people talk about salt that in Jesus' day, especially that um, it was of great value. And it's that word salt that uh, it's the root of the word salary. You may not have known that, that, um, that it's, it's salt was of great value. And while that's true, that's not what Jesus references here. It's that the salt gives flavor. It's that it just takes just a little bit of it. And it's in that little bit that it's not there to taste like salt. It's there to bring out the best in everything else. And without it, there's something missing the main ingredient. All of the ingredients together without the salt, you, you really can't, it doesn't have the flavor. Well, Jesus is saying this is who, who we are as disciples. This is who we are as the church. We're to, to bring out the best. We're to bring out the most. That we're to give the, the world a, a flavor. And he goes on to say if the salt has lost its flavor, well, it's not called salt anymore if it's lost its fl flavor. It's called sand if it's lost its flavor. And it's not good for anything. You walk on the sand, but you sure don't put it into your food. It sure doesn't give flavor. Well, he goes on to say, and you're the light of the world. Well, the church has always had an attraction to light from the very beginning. God's first word was, let there be light. And that was the beginning of creation. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Jesus calls you and me the light of the world. The Gospel of John starts off, says, in Jesus was light. And that light was the light of life. So, Jesus uses an expression that was a common experience of what they were going through. He says that, that you don't light a, a lamp and put it under a peck measure. Well, that didn't mean much to us nowadays, but back before the days of matches and, and Bic lighters, they liked to keep a flame going for a while because you, you didn't want to just blow it out or, or let it blow out. You also didn't want it to, to start a fire. So at night, if, if you were going to step outside the house, you, you didn't want the wind to blow out your, your lamp. So you put an earthenware basket over the top of it where it, enough to breathe but not enough to start a fire. And when you came back in, you'd take the basket off and that way it could shine and give light. Or even better yet, you put it on a lampstand where it could give even more light. But Jesus isn't talking about a singular light here. He says, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill that, that together, that it's our lights together that make a city. And now they, that doesn't mean to us much, but in the ancient world... Most often the cities were on a hill and it was the city that gave direction at night. It was the city that gave hope for the traveler at night. That all of our lights together, that yours and mine, that it's to give hope to the world. God's hope shining together it's to give purpose to the world. Our lights shining together to give direction 
to the world, all of our lights shining together. And it goes back to the very basic of what Jesus said, to love neighbor, that our light shines, our light shines through love of neighbor. And that's what I want to talk about first this morning, that our light shines through love of neighbor. You may know the name Albert, Albert Morabian, he professor emeritus at UCLA, and he did a, a study that's well known on, in communication. It says, what makes a person credible when they seek to communicate with others? And in this study, he studied how a person talked, what they said, and the message they tried to get across, and how others' attitude toward the message their feelings toward the message and toward the person. And what he discovered was that body language attributed to 55% of the communication. That the tone of the voice attributed 38% to the communication and the attitudes and feelings. His, he concluded that the words were only 7% of the attitudes and feelings toward communication. In other words, our light shines. Our attitudes, our feelings, they shine not just through our words, very little through our words, that our attitudes, our feelings shine a little bit more through, through our tone, the tone of our voice. But 55% is through our body language, what we act, the way we act, and how we do. That the love of God, the light, it shines through whether we intend for it to shine through or not. Our, our words may say one thing, but our attitudes, our feelings, they come out. Well, do we just back off and say, well, it is what it is? No. That when Jesus told us to love our neighbor, it was a command and that was the command that he gave to his disciples on the very last night of his life, that that's how we'll be known as, as disciples, as our, our love for one another. And the word that he uses for love right there isn't the love of a feeling or an attitude, that feelings can change and that attitudes can change. It's the love of an action, that it's what we do. that attitudes and feelings can change. It's what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. He didn't say, I love you just the way you are. He said, I love you the way you are, but I love you too much to leave you that way. And so he died on the cross to take away the power, the power of those, those attitudes and feelings that come naturally he rose from the grave to put his light, his attitude, his feeling that come not naturally but supernaturally through him. And that change, it's in the Greek word is metanoia. It's literally a change of attitude, a change of feeling, the way we, we a change of thinking. The way C.S. Lewis put it, he said, do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as you do this, you'll find one of the great secrets. When you're behaving as if you loved someone, you'll presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you'll find yourself disliking him more. If you do him good, a good turn, you'll find yourself disliking him less. Jesus rose from the grave to give you and me power we don't have. There may be that person out there that um, naturally you don't have feelings toward him or her. Naturally they're a little bit grating. Naturally that they aren't very lovable or even likable. Jesus even called us to love our neighbor and to let our light shine. And our light shines, it shines through what we do it shines through the tone of our voice and only very little through 
the words that we use. It doesn't mean we ought not use words. It means that we invite Jesus to make his home, to change, to turn, that our, li- our hearts, that our lights may shine in love of neighbor. But it's not only love of neighbor. The, verse 16 says, let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That our light shines in order to glorify God, not to glorify us in the way that our neighbor feels about us. That our light shines in order to, to glorify God and who God is. When my sister was in college, she would often bring home friends Well, there was one of her friends that she would bring home very often. And the family got to be so close with this particular friend that even when my sister didn't come home, sometimes for the four years of college, this friend of my sister's would come home and she would stay with the family over the weekend. And it was always enjoyed and invited. Well, after she graduated from college, she began to to date a young man and she would often bring him over to the house. And we'd visit for a long time, and we enjoyed it. Well, they got married. And when they got married, the, of course, the family was, was invited to the wedding because she was, felt very much a, a part of the family. Well, one, I remember <laughs> vividly, she and her new husband came over to the house, and, and we were talking about different things, and, and they said, yes, we, we bought a new car. And they were excited about their new car because they had worked a long time, both of them, to buy this, this new car. And he said, well, I'll drive it to work today. So he drove the, the new car to work. And when he came home, she said, well, I'd like to drive the new car to the grocery store. But she wasn't gone very long at all. And she came back. And he said, well, you didn't stay very long. And where are the groceries? She said, well, I, I couldn't go shopping. She said, I... I started to park in the parking lot, but the cars, I I knew if if somebody opened their door and scratched the car and uh, or dented it, that I didn't want to be the first one to put a dent in it. I I knew you'd be angry, you'd be disappointed. And and so I thought, well, I'll park away from the other cars and I'll park down the hill. And then I started, she said, I started thinking somebody let go of their their shopping cart and go down the hill and bang into the car. So I was just too nervous to take the new car to, to the grocery store because I was afraid I would be the first one and, and you'd be so disappointed that I, I was the first one to put a dent or a scratch in the car. He said, I'm so glad you said that. He said, when I drove the car to work this morning, he said, I couldn't park in the parking deck because the cars are so close to each other. I was afraid somebody was going to open their door and dent our, our new car. So I had to find a place on the street and I had to drive around for a long time before I found one on the street. And it was so far away from the office. By the time I got to the office, I was late getting to work because I was spent so much time parking our car. And he said, I know what we need to do. So he went to the garage. He came back and he had two hammers. <laughs> and he said, let's go to the car and we'll find an inconspicuous place and we'll both put the first dent and scratch on the car at the same time. So they both went out to the car, found an inconspicuous place, and took a whack at the car. (laughs) Well, I want to go ahead and tell you, I think that's pretty nutty. I think that's very nutty. But the point is, there's a connection. There's a connection between our hearts and our things, between our hearts and our stuff. The way Jesus put it, he says, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And he doesn't just pluck that out of many things. It's it's in Matthew chapter 6. Nearly half, if not the whole of the chapter of Matthew 6, is talking about a love for God and a love for neighbor. And he starts it with, and when you give alms, not... Think about giving alms or it's a good idea to give alms. Or think about, no, it's when, that it's expected, that it's something you do in your attitude toward God. And he uses that in the same context and, and when you pray. Not think about praying or it's a good idea to pray or you get so much benefit from prayer. No, he says, and when it's expected. And then he gives us the Lord's prayer. And then after he gives the Lord's prayer, he says, and when you fast, not 
if you fast or think about fasting or it's a good idea or have you ever heard of fasting? No, it's expected that all of these disciplines in, in loving God, the giving, the praying, the fasting, setting aside a time where we, we don't eat food in order to consider God and our relationship to him. That's where Jesus delivers the wisdom where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then he says that we can't serve God and our stuff. That we're called to let our, our life shine, shine in our giving, shine in the way that we give, shine in the way that we pray, shine in the way that we fast. Jesus in the New Testament uses the word faith 246 times. He uses the word hope 185 times. He uses the word love 733 times. Give or giving he refers to 2,285 times. It's in the giving. It's what we do with our things. But he says we're a city set on a hill. He's not just talking about our, uh, just us and, and Jesus got a good thing going. It's we're a city set on a hill. That it's our, our lights together that give direction. It's our lights together that give hope. It's our lights together that shine, that give glory to God. This is Giving Sunday. This is a Sunday where unabashedly and without embarrassment, I want to invite you to take a step forward in your, your life with God, in your devotion to God, and it's very connected to the things that are in our wallets that our light shines to give glory to God with our money. And with that money, we put our little with God's much. The first Monday of every month, we feed 250 families. We give groceries and home goods, some of it from our giving garden. Others of it, we connect with must ministries. And we feed nearly a thousand people. Most of these have children who speak English as a second language and our connection is through the, the schools here. Every week, we have 20 support groups helping people in the community know that they matter to God and that they matter to us. And they may meet here in our counseling center. It's one of the ways we let our light shine. We have 30 mission partners here and around the world. Places like Venezuela, where a case could be made that it's, it's, it's the poorest country in our, our hemisphere. And we're able to provide medicine, food to people who desperately need it. But it's not just there. It's in the Middle East. We've connected with a mission partner who has soccer. Soccer is one of the ways of getting children out of street gangs. And they're united in a game that they love together. And then as a part of that, Christ is shared. And in the Middle East, we educate girls in a country where girls have a difficult time receiving an education that we reach here and around the world, letting folks know that they matter to God and that they matter to us. Last week, we had 30 young men and women, boys and girls, confirmed in the faith. Four were baptized last Sunday. In February, we had our Alter Your Life where young people from all over the community spend a weekend here and in homes here on campus and in homes, over 180 youth, young people, for our Alter Your Light weekend. This summer, we had over 375 children and volunteers helping with our Vacation Bible School. We're only able to do that when we put our little with God's much. 
to make a difference in the world. Let our light shine to give glory to God and love of neighbor. It may be that you've never considered it. You've never thought about it. Prayer, of course you did. Maybe even fasting you did. But the giving, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We give not just our warm feelings. We give our treasure. And I want to invite you to do that as well. And I'd like to pray with you this morning. Pray. Jesus, this is, it's your time. It's your day. And we want to be your sons and daughters, your children, that your light, your life, that it might shine through us by what we do, that you died on the cross and rose from the grave, that you might live your life, shine your light through us in the way that we treat others. Well, that takes practice. It's not just a, a warm feeling or a nice thought. Breathe your Holy Spirit on us that we might practice that love of neighbor. And it may be that um, there are folks out there who've drawn the line at giving. Yeah, we can have good feelings about you. We might even pray to you every once in a while. But the giving part, well, that's for somebody else somewhere else. You've told us that a heart can't serve two masters, God and money. Jesus, come into our hearts that we might give glory to you as our lights shine. We put our lights together, our little with your much, and we become the, the city, the city of God that you, you intend us to be. We might give that hope. We might give that direction that's needed in this world today. Use us, Lord. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have a sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 11.15 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. <laughs>